The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. As the end of this difficult year approaches, some people's words linger. Tonight, we return to our conversation with Giller Prize winning novelist Ian Williams on his latest reluctantly political book about his disorienting experiences as a black man. Then from our Ontario hubs, we'll find out why ambulance delays are approaching crisis levels in some parts of this province. And from the brain science of food cravings to new treatments for COVID-19, we've got the agenda as we can review. It's Friday, December 3rd, and that's ahead on the agenda. A poet and Giller Prize winning novelist, Ian Williams' words explore the inner workings of life, family, love. But though his life's work is literature, again and again, he finds himself drawn into the political. His new book explains, it's called, Disorientation, Being Black in the World, and it's already been shortlisted for the 2021 Hillary Weston Writers Trust Prize for Nonfiction. Ian Williams is an associate professor of English at the University of Toronto and joins us now from the provincial capital. Hi, Ian, it's so nice to meet you. Hi, you too, Nam. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed this book, and uh, I don't know. If you were here, you could see how marked up it is. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, congratulations on a great, uh, on a great book. Um, the title of the book is Disorientation. What did you mean by that? So disorientation for me is the, um, the response that racialized people have to random or unprovoked reminders of our race. So we're going about our business, just doing our thing, and then someone interrupts our life to um, tell us about someone they know who likes reggae or, you know, um, to ask where you're from or some other kind of indication that says you are other, right? In this moment, you are a black subject um, and you are no longer the guy just trying to buy a shirt at H&M. Yeah, so that's disorientation. And I guess the second part to that, Nam, is that the recovery of that, from that disorientation, also burns up so much uh, mental energy for people of color. Um, I think some people might hear that and say, so what? Um, it's <laughs> just, you're, you're maybe you're being too sensitive, maybe the person is complimenting you because you remind them of right. Michael Jordan, whatever it is. <laughs> but what does it do to the person who's getting that uh, message? Right, right. Yeah, I don't know about people's intentions. I don't read hearts or anything like that for a living. Um, but I know its effect on me to snap me out of the task that I'm doing and then to refocus. People say this about the internet too, right? Like, you know, you're you're doing one thing, you get sidetracked, and it takes, what, 15 minutes to get back on, on track? Now, imagine that in, like, human terms. Uh, you're trying to focus on something or trying to do your job. You get snapped out of it. And how much mental energy do you burn up on your commute back or, um, you know, when you could be having really sort of engaged moments with your family, processing the day's events through a racial lens. Um, why write a book of essays in this particular time on this subject? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, last year when I began, I was living in Vancouver at the time, there were wildfires. <laughs> there was a pandemic really starting to like take hold here in North America. And um, of course, the justice movements that started in the U.S. and spread around the world. And I put aside the novel that I was working on in order to write this book. It had a kind of urgency to it. I turned 40 a few years ago. Um, and to be honest with you, I was kind of confused internally. There was a lot of noise that was happening externally. Confused and I about what? To make, confused about how this world can still exist, although we all know better, right? I mean, the social system can still exist and the justice system can still um, propagate injustices, although we all know better. And all of the noise that I was hearing around me um, was kind of similar to the noise inside of me. So I decided, um, Ian, there's no safety on shore, right? There's no safety trying to avoid this kind of conversation. You need to figure out what you think and you need to understand how this world is working because it's affecting you and breaking you down on a daily basis. And so that's the urgency and the impetus behind this book, Nam. 
Um, you said that you were um, avoiding it, and you write, I know a fair bit, but never enough to seize authority. My dissatisfaction mm. with my knowledge, coupled with my tepid emotions, occasionally nauseates me. Would I mm. not be a better human if I were informed and angry? Then I could be righteous. I should be vocal, more than vocal, loud. I have received the message that to be black these days is to be perpetually outraged and distressed, fed up, tired. To be anything apart from that is treacherous and out of touch. Is that what you mean? Mm. Wow. Yeah. So I admire activists. I admire people who are very vocal. And I admire those people who are on the front lines um, doing work in our courts and our, our, our civil systems. But not all of us have the fortitude or temperament uh, to do that kind of racial work. And so the fact that some that a black person in a moment is in a moment of injustice is quiet doesn't mean that that black person does not care or is not necessarily engaged. There are features of personality too that determine how we respond to tragedy. Some of us get sad, some of us just drink ourselves into forgetfulness, right? Um, and what I wanted to do in, in that quotation is recognize what's expected of us and then give people of color options or ways to be themselves still, right? That we don't have to sacrifice ourselves to some kind of single universal idea of what blackness is or does. Um, we can care and we can further progress um, in our own ways. Um, I, you know, you said you say in the book that uh, you are apolitical, and it's something that I, mm. I, whenever anyone has said uh, I'm, they're apolitical, I've kind of looked at them kind of sideways, like, what do you mean like, by that? Everything is, <laughs> everything is political. So in a way, when you were when reading that, to me, kind of challenged how I view things. Is it even possible to be apolitical at a time when just being who you are is an act of, is a political act? Right, right. So it's one of these words that unfortunately these days has become charged and loaded and um, abused, so much so that I think within a few years, it's just going to empty out of meaning altogether, right? Um, we saw this a little bit with what what is feminist any, feminism anymore, right? Um, and I feel, uh, what is empathy? Why people are throwing around these words? And to a more glib extent, what does it awesome mean anymore? Um, I think political, I'm never quite sure what people mean by that. But the dominant way of sort of using it in society these days is... Um, well, in two ways, right? There's sort of political movements and political politics, right? But there's also the sense of um, it being a kind of cause that's aligned already with a position, right? So to be political is to have uh, like left-leaning tendencies, which, you know, doesn't bother me or anything, but to have uh, your position predetermined as the basis of the conversation, I have a little bit of, of a problem with. And some of us don't live our lives with that as the dominant um, dominant lens. What if I went through and I said, everything is art, right? Everything is a work uh, or an attempt at artistic beauty. And so I think the people who say everything is political, important, because it sensitizes us to a kind of slice of life. But then there are writers and artists and other people who say, everything is art and how beautiful are you living your life and what are you doing with it? So, yeah, I, not to dispute you, Nam, right? But I hope you understand what oh, I no, mean. No, no, I it. totally understand it, and I think um, yeah. I think a lot of people in, just to we're talking about politics. The election in Canada happened, and I think we saw this a, a lot in the American election. And they were doing the postmortem mm -hmm. who voted for um, President Trump, and it turns out black people indeed voted for President Trump. And some people couldn't believe that. I kind of understood that because I, I, black people are not a monolith, and maybe mm. some people voted for him because they see themselves as American first. Mm. Yeah, and you know, it's always hard in those moments. You say it, I'm like, how and why? And all of that, which betrays that I, in fact, do have like political commitments, right? Mm -hmm. I do. Um, and you know, we hope that people share them with us. Um, but also to give people the right to have their own, um, and so there are black Trump supporters. I'd be curious to know, like, what are they thinking, like, genuinely, right? Like, without being pejorative or without being condescending or anything, like, what are they seeing that I'm not, not quite getting? 
it could be taxes, right? But that's a con <laughs> another conversation for another day. But I want to go back into the book again. And, and you write, I can no more stop the disorienting effects of such events than I can opt out of weather or grammar. It's not that I find race in everything, but that race finds me. How does race find you? Yeah, right. It seems to, um, it's inescapable, right? So. I could be doing something pretty innocuous, like stepping into an elevator and the body language of the woman in the elevator tightens. And someone would say, is that a racial act or whatever? And I would say, yes, because I've seen that before and I can layer that on top of my past experiences. Um, I open my Twitter feed, it's all there. You could argue and say, hey, that's self-selecting. You choose who you follow and all of that, right? Um, so it's hard to explain to a doubtful audience that um, that like I'm not pursuing race. I really am not, right? But if I just want to live with a reasonable degree of openness, mm -hmm. the messages that I receive from the world are in fact racially inflected, right? Persistently racially inflected. What, what effect does that have when, because I guess uh, when it comes to racism or bigotry, some of it is mm -hmm. very uh, very, it's out there. Like it's, but even with George Floyd, when he um, when he was murdered, um, we saw the video, and you saw people commenting on online. Well, he didn't follow orders, or he was <sighs> making right. all these um, say, I, I guess, excusing the behavior of the police officer right. instead of seeing right. the humanity of Mr. Floyd. Um, right. What effect does that have on a person when you always have to feel like you're um, defending yourself, as if your word is not your bond? Yeah, it's so exhausting to keep proving yourself, right? Um, and we know this for like you step into a grad school class and you're like constantly asked to defend your point of view and defend your point of view. And at some point you just kind of want to live and be trusted. But I think when people constantly ask us for proof of racism, the underlying presumption there is that, or assumption there is that we uh, cannot be trusted to process the world. <laughs> Right, that what we think has to be corroborated, that we are not sophisticated enough um, to have the apparatus to know what's going on. And that kind of doubt can really sort of do damage on you long term because it can mean that as I process the world myself, it's not just a healthy skepticism that I, I greet it with, but with all of these other messages of in your perceptive apparatus is flawed somehow, right? You are somehow damaged. You don't know what is going on here. This objectively is not a problem. You are overly sensitive. And all of those messages that sort of bombard um, people of color need to be like put in their proper place. And no, you know what you're seeing. You know what you're feeling as a person of color. Um, it cannot be proven, I think I say in the book. Sometimes it is just known. Um, and what's going on in those moments is that the, your interlocutor, the person that you're speaking with, does not have that lived experience to know what it feels like intuitively. We've experienced it so much that it's gone to the level of intuition or gut, um, to know what it feels like in your gut to be discriminated against. Um, you, you, see, you write this story about uh, an experience your friend went, with, went through with a police officer, and this mm. line just sticks out in my head. Uh, you write, humiliation like shame doesn't need an audience. Right. Which was so right. incredibly powerful. Uh, so right. the dynamics of that, can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's this kind of external proving to people, right? To sort of piggyback on what you asked before just now, this need to prove to others, but also this kind of internalized audience that we have them in our heads. Um, and so uh, if something happens at work, I've worked in very good places the last few years. Um, if something happens at work and I need to explain that, I run through all of those motions internally first. Like how would a white person see this? What might a white person uh, what's their frame of knowledge coming into this conversation? How can I expand their frame of knowledge so that they can see what I'm seeing? Um, but my humiliation is private and my own, and the countless kinds of indignities I have uh, working, uh, it, sort of coming into contact with service people um, or just in the daily circuit of my life, those indignities remain private and embarrassing to share, although I do share some of them in the book. Um, and frankly, I, I don't think I should have to parade the evidence of my life forward for people to trust and believe me. I feel like as a human being, I, I, I should have a basic and default kind of level of 
trustworthiness. Um, you know, when you say that the embarrassed part, you know, I've experienced microaggressions and I've found myself in situations where other people have caused me harm. I haven't, just me being me, um, yeah. and I've, I've felt embarrassed by it, humiliated even. But why is the person who is, I don't like using the word victim, but why is it that you're feeling embarrassed and right. you're holding that shame in private? Right, it's not one of the bizarre things of racism, right? That you could be abused and exploited, and many abused people feel this too, right? That the abuse is somehow t something to do with you, um, and maybe um, if I had done something differently. So the fallout of uh, disorientation is that kind of mental repair work to repair myself psychically afterwards um, involves asking those questions: Should I have done something differently? Should I have smiled more? Should I have worn a different shirt? When I entered the elevator, um, should I have uh, acknowledged the person there? Um, all these things, is my hair too long? Is my hair threatening? What's going on in those moments? And um, that kind of after processing, that post processing, um, I don't think white people go through their lives constantly revisiting situations through those racial lenses. We revisit situations in all the other ways too, right? I said something stupid at work, or, you know, um, uh, I, I'm feeling tired and maybe, you know, whatever, right? We have all these other things that we're processing, and then there's that filter of race. What happened racially in that dynamic? Um, you say that you don't think that white people go through that. Um, mm. You write this story about uh, this horrible incident that your niece went through. Um, mm. She's uh, multi-ethnic. And um, you write about the black epiphany. But you, white people, while white people might not go through that, I think there, you write about how there is an understanding of using certain words or doing certain mm. things to, uh, say, black people, where they mm. know that they, they are in power. Can you tell mm -hmm. us about what happened mm -hmm. to your niece? Yeah, so I talked about the time my niece was called the N-word for the first time. Uh, she was still in elementary school, um, quite young. And like she that moment of racial, yeah, she was 10, right? That's what, grade five? And so that racial awareness of suddenly uh, someone pulling a card out that you hadn't seen before and levying it on you. Uh, the white girl who did it clearly knew that this word had power and she deployed it at the right time and knocked my niece off balance. Black people come into a kind of racial awareness and I think a white person can go their entire lives without coming into a racial awareness. That's personal. I don't mean like an understanding of, you know, black exists and injustice exists and all of that. But of the ways that their whiteness grants privilege and affords them, uh, you know, uh, ease to move through life. Um, so that kind of awareness, um, it would be great if white people had moments of discomfort and disorientation, if they had um, a, a real sort of one-on-one -on -one, uh, chance to process what it feels like, being knocked down mm -hmm. by surprise and then having to reconstitute your, your identity in racial terms. Um, and you know what, Nam, sometimes it does happen to white folks infrequently, right? If you push a white person and ask, um, no, where are you really from? You, not me, you, where are you from? And they go back beyond Canada and they say, I'm from Bulgaria and my mom's from Ukraine. Um, and then something in them is able to understand what an immigrant's experience is like. The difference, though, is that they can tuck that away permanently. They never have to deploy that. They never have to even mention that unless someone pushes, because whiteness embraces them uh, in a way that, like, humanity still tries to hold black people at arm's length. Well, you write that race originates in the white imagination. Uh, what did you mean by that? Yeah, well, I think people generally think that race is this kind of black issue, right? That black people feel it, we uh, are affected by it, and we're the ones who will find solutions to it and tell people what to do about it, right? Tell us what, we'll tell you what we need and then you can do it or not do it. Um, but this is not a problem we created, and so the burden of like solving this problem mm -hmm. uh, is like unfairly placed on us uh, for that obvious reason, and unfairly placed on us too, because we're in a racial dynamic. Um, and there are white people who are complicitly participating in this and also have a responsibility. Um, and so they too need to participate in the resolution of this. 
So uh, if a white person has constructed my life uh, thousands of years ago, constructed what I mean and how much I'm worth and what I can do and think and whether I will be trusted or not, I think it behooves a white person too to figure out um, how to undo some of that. Um, how do you go about undoing that? Because it seems as if we get um, heads are, you know, you go through the day, uh, you have microaggressions. I've come to the point where I just don't even uh, acknowledge certain microaggressions. Um, right. And then you have, um, when you do talk about this stuff, there is this pushback, no, this doesn't exist, and mm. someone might use a quote from Dr. King, um, and then you just <laughs> right. end up being at a stalemate. So how do we, right. how do we get to the point of moving forward and actually right. acknowledging this large elephant in the room? Right, right. Yeah. You know, I'm not sure how constructive anger is and all of that. I believe it starts with those kinds of kitchen table conversations. Um, about, okay, what was it like from the Ukraine and, and the Belarus or wherever? It begins on that kind of one-on-one -on -one personal level. And I'm speaking uh, in my own skin, okay? I'm not speaking for the race or anything like that. Um, I believe that where progress can be had uh, is in, like, on an individual level. Um, to first of all, like, explore and identify those kinds of biases and thinking, um, and then to kind of deal with them. I don't know if we can imagine sort of a, a, a future time that is like raceless completely and completely just. I, I, I think uh, like civil and political structures are just too complex and too dependent on inequity um, for that to happen in our lifetimes. Um, but I do think our relations can be more humane on this one-to-one -on -one -one level, that the microaggression rate, whoever's monitoring that, should decrease um, just through these, these kinds of conversations. Um, and then eventually enough of that. I think about it as a kind of trickle up movement rather than a trickle down Republican thing. Um, so where, with enough ki kindness and compassion, we can trickle upward towards um, systemic change. Um, we're in 2021 and we're still having the first of, um, <laughs> we see that happening in the States with Kamala Harris making history. Um, right. You know, you write about being the only, the first. How does right. that, affect you when you are walking into these rooms on a nearly basis and like your partner one point in the one of the essays that you write um mm. makes fun of you and says because you keep a diary <laughs> of how many black people i saw today um right, right. but how how does that affect you on a daily basis right 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 my diary ian's diary of comforts right <laughs> ian's book of comforts um every time i saw a black person um yeah, so it's, it's a day-to-day -day basis, but it's been happening since like, uh, you know, high school and university, right? If you're in predominantly white spaces throughout your life, um, you get to uh, be shaped according to uh, certain preferences and impressions about like what you should be. Um, but I'll liken it to this, Nam, here. Uh, I think we are used to it. Black people, we often occupy spaces that are predominantly white. Right, and so we don't even bat an eye anymore at this. Uh, but if I were to ask a white person I, uh, to do the same, I'm said, I'm going to displace you here from your comfortable life. I'm going to drop you in Tokyo, or I'm going to drop you in Nigeria, and you're going to be the only white person in just moving through your life. You're going to buy groceries. You're going to go to your job. You're going to do all the things you normally do. Um, and tell me how you feel. And suddenly they will be aware of their whiteness in a way they have never been aware of it before. That kind of hypervisibility um, will do its work um, in that situation. And you know what? I would go further and say that most white people in that situation would opt out, would find a way out of it, um, unless they are being worshipped, right? Unless like their whiteness carries some kind of advantage, and then you know they'll stay and, and play God. Um, but given the chance of being the only and the exceptional, constantly reminded of their whiteness day after day, I think they would avoid that situation and get out of it somehow. As black folks, as people of color, we don't have that option. Um, thank you so much for writing this book. I wish we had more time. I'll end mm -hmm. on this note. Despite all of that, you write, your obligations to the world don't stop despite its hostility to you, and we keep moving forward, right? Uh, thanks for that, Nam. Uh, 
And congratulations on being inducted into the Brampton Arts Walk of Fame as well. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ian. Appreciate it. Thanks. Blaring sirens help ambulances carry patients at top speed to the hospital. It's not helpful then if once they arrive, patients and the paramedics treating them are stuck in lineups waiting for care. Justin Chandler covers the Hamilton Niagara region for Ontario Hubs. He's been looking into why that's reaching troubling levels in St. Catharines and other Ontario health regions. Hey Justin. Hey there. All right, so for your latest article on TBO.org, you talk a lot about offload delays. What exactly is that? So an offload is the process that paramedics and hospital staff go through when care for the patient is transferred between those two groups. So once a patient has been registered and is under hospital care and off an EMS stretcher, they've been offloaded. So the provincial standard for that ever since 2007 has been 30 minutes. If the process takes longer, as is frequently the case, especially now, that is considered an offloading delay. All right, so why is this such a problem in the Niagara region, specifically St. Catharines, but we're also seeing it in other parts of the province as well, correct? Yes, uh, they would say this is actually happening um, all throughout the, the province, paramedics are saying. So um, in the Niagara region, some of the things that have been cited are um, hospitals getting back into regular operations. And this has meant that all the people who had delayed things or um, people who maybe had health problems and those problems are now worse because they weren't getting hospital care during pandemic closures when hospitals were more focused on COVID and had paused certain operations uh, just mean that there's a significantly higher level of demand. Um, and that coupled with uh, staff burnout in hospitals and at paramedics, um, that's just meant that there's fewer people available. And then there's just the continuation of hospital bed shortages, which has been a problem in the province for years. Well, let's talk about that. We've, of course, we've talked about hallway medicine for quite a while. What exactly are you hearing from experts in the hospitals talking about sort of the, the ripple effect from bed shortages to these offload delays? Well, one of the things that they're saying is that really hospitals are just running out of places to put people. So because potentially there's not enough long-term care spaces or because there are too few community paramedic programs uh, that can treat people outside of hospitals. Um, hospital beds end up getting taken up by people who maybe don't actually need hospital level care, but need to be cared for somewhere. And so they end up in hospitals. And that just means that there are fewer places that incoming patients can actually be moved to um, in an expeditious amount of time. I think there's one thing a lot of people don't think about is, you know, once you call the, the paramedics, the ambulance comes, gets you on the stretcher, gets you to the hospital, and then they're waiting there. This actually ties up sort of resources for other calls as well. Uh, what's sort of the shortage in terms of ambulances for other calls? Have we been seeing some stories on that as well? Yeah, yeah, this is a, a big concern. And it, it's something that, so for example, Niagara EMS, um, the, the chief there, Kevin Smith, he said that this is actually a crisis because not only are people waiting so long, but when these ambulances are tied up, it means that there's not other ambulances available for calls. Um, so this can even mean that in some cases there might not be any ambulances available for calls. And Hamilton has logged that um, in the last several several months um, that that's been happening. So really, uh, it's sort of this problem where it, it hits us from multiple ends. So not only are patients waiting in hospitals sometimes for hours for care, but then those paramedics are also there and they're not on duty being able to respond while well, they are on duty, but they're not they're not in their same capacity where they can just go out to a call. Um, and so it means that then people who are trying to get help are waiting longer too. On that point, I'm, I'm curious, uh, are patients getting care when they are still waiting for bed, say if they're in the ambulance or sort of uh, just ready to be offloaded into the hospital? Yes, the paramedic leaders that I've talked to have said that um, yes, paramedics um, are trained to do a high level of care and they're going to do the best that they can, um, but they don't do hospital care. So there's some things here that can be a little tricky. Um, so paramedics um, won't have permission necessarily to give patients food. 
Um, so like in the past seven months in Niagara, um, before my article came out, about 350 people waited four to six hours for care. Mm -hmm. um, so in that four to six hours, you could get hungry, maybe you've got to go pee. And so the paramedics are going to have to be talking to hospital staff trying to figure out, okay, this patient that we've got here, um, is it okay if we feed them? Um, they've got to negotiate whether they can can give them that sort of care because there's only so many things that they're legally allowed to do in that time frame. Four to six hours, that's that's quite a, a long time. I, I am curious, is there are we seeing an increase in, say, more serious health issues or, say, fatalities uh, because of sort of these offset delays? This is a little bit trickier. The paramedic services have said that if people are in life-threatening conditions, and in Hamilton, for example, that's just about 10% of EMS transfers to the hospital, that you're much less likely to wait. Um, but I also had it said that, you know, it, it could happen that someone is in serious need and does end up waiting longer. Um, it's more likely, though, that someone who's in a less life-threatening condition um, but still needs hospital care would be the sort of person who's waiting. Now, earlier this year, I actually spoke to uh, a couple of paramedics, and they were explaining sort of the day-to-day the -day struggles that they had where, you know, they would go through a 12-hour shift and not have a lunch break, or, you know, they wouldn't have a chance to go to the washroom because they have to be beside their patient as they wait. I'm curious, what have you been hearing uh, from paramedics in terms of the, the impact it's had on their health? Yeah, Chief Smith in Niagara was saying that this has definitely been something that's contributing to staff burnout um, and to increase sick, sick uh, pay usage. So, for example, the average offload delay recently has been 90 minutes. And uh, what I'm hearing that means for paramedics is that uh, they're going to be going right back out um, shortly after being in the hospital. They're lacking that time that they can decompress. And they've said that from April to August this year in Niagara, sick time has been up 33% which equates to about $121,000. So this is a problem that ends up costing a lot of money too. As you can even look as this time that everyone's spending in hospital in Niagara right now, it's forecast that by the end of the year, that's going to be about $20,000. Um, the service is saying that that's over 2 million in, in lost time. Speaking of money, uh, we know earlier this week the province announced that they would be expanding uh, one of the hospitals in the Peel region. But I'm curious, are health regions or the Ontario government doing anything to address this specific issue, knowing that you know there are some ripple effects as well with bed shortages and such, but to this specific issue? Yes, there are different things. So the Ontario government, for example, they've said that they've done work to try and increase um, how paramedics can treat people in the community without taking them to hospital. They've also provided in some areas funding for nurses to help with offloading. And this is something that paramedics and hospitals are working together on, um, just trying to find any sort of way that they can make things go faster. Um, so some examples that I've heard, um, things that are in discussion um, could be, for example, um, maybe nursing students helping offload patients instead of that just being a regular nurse, or maybe changing it so that it's not paramedics who are transferring people in between hospitals. Um, but people are looking for all sorts of ways that we can save um, a little bit of time, um, because although, yes, this is a big systemic issue, um, those things take time to fix, and there's problems now, and it sounds like uh, people want to come up with some creative solutions. Well, we'll look forward to that. I really appreciate it. Justin, thank you so much for this. Thank you. The agenda this week heard the case for a four-day work week, got advice on how to turn everyday anxiety into a superpower, learned about promising treatments for COVID-19, and fact-checked the occurrence of breakthrough cases. The Agenda's Week in Review begins with writer Mark Schatzker on why dieting will never be the answer to obesity. Let's just go through some of them here because there's South Beach, there's Atkins, there's Keto, there's, uh, well, I don't have to go through the list. There's so many potential diets on offer. And I guess the, the first and obvious place to start in our discussion is, do any of them work? Well, the fact that you listed so many would suggest that perhaps not. But what's so interesting is our, our continued enthusiasm. You know, every two years, it seems there's a new diet, and we think this, this must be right. And there's this walk down memory lane. You remember Scarsdale, The Zone. There's a reason, though, it's happening this way, and it's because diets both work and don't work. And here's how it works. 
all diets, roughly all diets work for about the first six to eight months. You, you know, the pounds start to melt away. You, you fit into your old pants again. People start having to straighten. They say, you look great. And then you hit this wall around six months usually, and you swear the scale must be lying. I'm not eating as much. What's going on? And it starts to come back. So people say, the diet worked, I failed. So they try the same diet again next year, or they try maybe a new diet. So that's why I've been kind of on this yo-yo treadmill of continually dieting. But, but the truth is, for most people, they don't work. You say they hit the wall. What technically is the wall? It's their brain. Uh, the brain, this is one of the most interesting things about body weight is that it's regulated by the brain. The same way your brain controls your heartbeat, the same way it controls your body temperature, it controls how much you weigh. And it, it doesn't like when we start to lose weight. That's why we get hungry. That's why we feel fatigued. But it also doesn't like if we weigh too much. When scientists do overfeeding studies, which is to say they put people in a lab and feed them a whole ton of food, they can't stand it. It's so unpleasant that they had to do these first studies in prisons. And even then people would drop out of the study. And, and but then once they you know manage to get them fat when the study ends the pounds just seem to melt away again so there's this idea that the brain has a set point it, it has you know it knows what what it wants you to weigh and it's uh, it's going to make sure that's how much you weigh this is a thesis that of course could put a lot of people out of business uh so I, i'm kind of curious as to what kind of reception you're getting out there for this idea well it's uh, it, what's so interesting to me is that We've had this endless culture about dieting. The scientists have known this for decades. The early overfeeding studies were done in 1950s, 1960s. Um, but we've almost as though we've chosen to ignore it, that, that we think we can control what we eat the same way you, you know, decide if I'm gonna turn my car left, turn my car right, that, that we have executive control over our body weight. And it's just not like that. The reception I'm getting from, from readers is they're like, wow, thanks for making this clear. I had a funny feeling it worked this way. And, and now, you know, it, it sheds a lot of light as to how things actually work. Now, you did something very nice in writing this book, and that is you got to go to Italy. You traveled to Italy, and you came back with some uh, most interesting observations about the nature of obesity in the United States compared to Italy. What did you find? Well, Italy is, it's like going down the rabbit hole in Alice in Wonderland. Um, everything we think we know about eating and nutrition doesn't make sense when you travel to Italy. I spent some time in Bologna. That's where we get the word bologna. They call it mortadella, their version. I'd say it's better, but you can actually see these cubes of white fat. They're not afraid of fat in Italy. They're not afraid of carbs. Northern Italy is particularly interesting because they do not eat a Mediterranean diet. It's not olive oil and fish. It's butter. It's cheese. It's pasta. Um, they revere the two nutrients we've been fighting a war against, which is to say fat and carbs, and they weave them together in these ethereal combinations that are so good, the entire world travels to Italy just so I can eat what that guy next to me is eating. They have rules. There's a repository in Bologna of official recipes. Um, they have a golden noodle at the Chamber of Commerce. It, it is the perfect platonic noodle. So you would think if deliciousness and good food is really the enemy, then you'd expect the North Italians to be the plumpest in all the world. And they are just unfathom, unfathomably thin. Uh, the rate of obesity in Canada is 26%. South of the border, 42%. Italy, 8%. It, it's it's mind-boggling. We talk about neuroplasticity, and that's yes. what you're into. You want to tell us what yes. that is? So brain plasticity or neuroplasticity is the brain's amazing capacity to be able to change and grow um, in response to the environment. Unfortunately, so that's good positive brain plasticity. There's also negative brain plasticity, which shows that in other negative environments that include a lot of stress, your brain can actually shrink and become damaged. So we can go in both directions. And my whole research program has been in trying to understand those um, interventions that bring us to positive brain plasticity that helps our brains grow and strengthen. So it is possible to live with anxiety in a healthy way, yes? Yes, absolutely. For example? Think about a situation where there's no anxiety at all, no stress at all. What comes with anxiety and that energy that comes with stress is action. 
it uh, comes ambition. And so without that stress and, and uh, anxiety, uh, we would be just laying on the couch all over the place. A lot of our motivation comes from that um, uh, emotion of anxiety. And so what I try and do in my book, Good Anxiety, is show you how to channel the energy uh, of anxiety from that too high an energy that, that makes everything spiral down and makes you lose your words and, and not perform well to that slot where you are performing best. I always say the best talks that I've ever given in my whole life. I was scared. I was anxious before I went on stage. And that is a great example of channeling your anxiety to perform well. So should I infer that because I don't think you're demonstrating any anxiety right now at all in your conversation with me, that you're completely calm and not all that fussed about doing this interview? I am an excellent actress. <laughs> no. I, well done. So, you know, when it's a TV interview and potentially millions of people can see, I am... I am a little anxious before, and I just try and tell myself, enjoy yourself, have a good time, just try and uh, share your knowledge. But, um, you know, it, it, uh, I have skills that have come with being a professor <laughs> and being a public speaker. But, yeah, I, uh, there's something a little bit wrong if I'm not a little bit worried, a little bit tense about, is all this equipment going to work? Is my internet going to go out? Are they going to ask me? The one thing that really gets me scared is, are they going to ask me something I don't know the answer to? <laughs> so as long as you don't do that, I'm going to stay nice and calm. I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret. I feel the same way before each interview, too. So we've got that going in common. There you go. Talk to us about your six superpowers, because you do mention them in the book about how to channel good anxiety. The six yeah. are what? Yeah. So, you know, um, the ultimate uh, uh, end point of learning how to use your good anxiety, you turn the anxiety down and you kind of learn from those difficult emotions. But it took me to six gifts or superpowers that I talk about in the book. And those six gifts are resilience, flow, mindset, productivity, empathy or compassion, and creativity. And um, I don't think we have time to talk about all of them, but these are things that are truly enhanced by your particular form of anxiety. And I think the idea of a four-day work week is great. There's a lot of constraints uh, around how it's implemented and how effective it can be, and there has to be a lot of flexibility. You know, this is not a new idea. In fact, when I was doing some research for the show, I, I found that, you know, this idea of a four-day work week popped up in the 1950s, and people were doing research on it, you know, in the 1970s, and it was predicted then that it was going to be this big new thing. I think what's turbocharged all this discussion of a four-day work week is obviously COVID. Um, it's thrown a Molotov cocktail through our office windows, and uh, it's making us, us question everything. And there's no doubt that people want more autonomy. They want more flexibility. They want more freedom in choosing how and when they work. And this idea of a four-day work week can take advantage of that desire. Now, the concern I have is uh, obviously it has to be uh, – uh, to work for everyone, but it also we also have to see whether the the positive effects uh, last over time. So you know, people often experience regression to the mean with their affect and with their behaviors. So we have to see whether this uh, this actually does result in long term productivity gains or long term benefits in terms of engagement and satisfaction. Okay, hold off on that. W whether it's good for the long run aspect of the argument for a second, because I want to I want to circle back to something you just put on the record a second ago. You say they looked at this back in the 50s and in the 70s. So yeah. clear, clearly there are, are management people who have uh, been curious about this enough to study it. Why do you suppose yeah. that in all of these intervening decades, it's never really been tried? Well, it has been tried. Uh, it's just, you know, for something like this to really work, you need large scale adoption because you're asking organizations to change the way that they do business in a sense. Uh, and it has to be a very flexible model, uh, as Andrew said, because 
there's so many different constraints and so many different issues to deal with um, when you're implementing a system like this. For it to be successful, it has to be incredibly flexible. So, you know, what if you have a team and you've got a member of the team who decides they want to take Tuesday off when the rest of the team decides they want to take Fridays off? How does that work? So all of these questions need to be addressed and answered for this to be successful. So that's probably why we haven't seen wide scale adoption yet. But COVID has been such a big trigger for mass, uh, massive changes in the workplace. It's a good time for something like this to really take hold. Andrew, how do you get around the conundrum that uh, David just described? What we do is that we put the challenge to each of the teams. So I don't actually schedule anything. What I say is the key issue is that we need the same level of productivity, preferably better. We also need to make sure that customer service standards aren't impacted. So each team understands that they need to be able to continue to service the clients appropriately. Now, after that, it's up to each team, team leader, to schedule who takes what time or when. Now, we don't have a situation everybody takes Friday off or everybody takes Monday off, because then that doesn't work. So if you want a Friday off, maybe you'll get Friday this week, but maybe next week you won't. You'll have to take a different day. Uh, the only thing that, that is consistent is where we have, as I've said, you know, parents of kids who are at school, they probably want to work a five day, but they want compressed hours. We leave it to the teams to sort that out. I've never, ever had to intervene since we put this in place, what is now over three years ago. Hmm. Parisa, I wonder if, I wonder if you asked your own employer, the C.D. Howe Institute, uh, this is something I think we should try. What do you think the reaction would be? I'm not really certain about that, but I would say giving flexibility, that would be very helpful. This is what workers would need, even at the city, how uh, being having flexibility in terms of what time to work or from where to work, really important. But in terms of reducing the hours, that my concern is that, for example, if um, if if a work needs to be done in co uh, collaboration with other workers, if someone doesn't want to be available in a specific day, how that collaboration would work and how uh, how the work can be done. That's that's my concern about that. But of, of course, giving flexibility to workers would be increased productivity and satisfaction. And it would be something that uh, even we have seen before COVID time and uh, during the COVID that um, hybrid model of uh, work from home and also a, co uh, a combination with being at the workplace is uh, going to be very beneficial for everyone. And Andrew, for how many years have you been doing it this new way with the four-day work week at your company? We started in the, the beginning of 2018. 2018. Okay, so David, tell me this. That's mm -hmm. that's about three years worth of data, three years worth yeah. of experience upon which to make a judgment. Andrew tells us the productivity at his company has gone up 25% since they went to this. Is that enough time mm -hmm. to be able to conclude, yeah, this works. You get more productivity when you do it this way. Um, listen, it's, it's one company and it's positive and then certainly it's going in the right direction. But what you have to uh, look at beneath all of the, this is that Andrew is offering uh, his team a hell of a lot of product of, of uh, flexibility and autonomy. And that's what people want. Monoclonal antibodies. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's start there. What are they? So monoclonal is, is really just means one type. And so these are one type of antibody. There are two on the Canadian market. Uh, one uh, that is uh, made by Roche, a, a compound called casaribabab imdebimab, uh, and the other by uh, GSK, which is a compound called citrovimab. And so, you know, when you think about antibodies, these are the proteins that bind to the virus that we make after we get vaccinated, if we get infected, and they're what leads to our immune response. They bind to the virus, they stick to the virus, and that leads to clearance from the immune system. It leads to the virus not getting into our cells and leading to more replication. How widely are they being... Monoclonal antibodies... I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, do you know how widely they're used in Canada at the moment? Yeah, so monoclonal antibodies essentially are these. Like, you, we give them as, as humanized antibodies or, or synthetic antibodies that mimic human antibodies in that sense. They're approved in Canada, and in fact, the two compounds that I mentioned have been approved for the last few months. 
the implementation issues of these drugs have made it a lot harder to actually get to the market and get to patients. And, and you know, this is because it's an IV infusion. Uh, it has to be given again within a certain time interval of testing positive and having symptoms. Um, you know, an IV infusion for a COVID patient means that you have to go see a COVID patient. It can't be done remotely. You have to actually put in the IV and, and observe them. Uh, and so, uh, and, and you know, people are obviously worried about side effects with infusions and, and drugs that are going intravenously. So, you know, they have been available. They've been used around the world. They're actually quite, uh, um, you know, recommended. They're the only drug that's actually recommended by the World Health Organization for the early treatment of COVID-19. But the implementation in Canada has been a bit piecemeal. The Public Health Agency of Canada has bought these drugs. They are sitting in all the provinces for distribution. But again, local solutions have made it a little bit difficult to kind of make this a reality for all patients who need to access them. Is their use more widespread in the United States? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we saw this uh, throughout the last wave in the United States. Some uh, states like Florida actually doubled down on this as part of their reopening strategy to have easy access. Uh, so, you know, thousands and thousands of clinics in the states, they're paid for and I think federally subsidized. Uh, and so, you know, they're recommended for all sorts of patients aggressively in the United States uh, for, for the treatment of early COVID-19. We know that there are more and more people who are getting COVID-19 and for whom the symptoms are not going away. The so-called long COVID, it sticks around and the effects are uh, quite persistent and uh, quite debilitating for some people. Do you know whether these medications would work on long COVID? Yeah, and, and this is where the origins of long COVID come from, right? So, you know, there there is some discussions around whether or not this is a chronic inflammatory disease and is autoimmune mediated where, you know, these compounds may not benefit as much. But certainly there is, you know, maybe a, a, a still an infectious component. And, and one of the interesting uh, things that's come up is people who are vaccinated who have long COVID symptoms a, a small minority of them, probably 10, 15 percent, actually get profound changes in their symptoms after vaccine. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it really does bring into the question of whether or not all of the infection is gone and, and uh, you know, the mechanisms like this may actually trigger the immune system to clear the rest of it. So, you know, there is a lot of look at monoclonal antibodies as a adjunct to, to long COVID in, in terms of describing. It's not there yet, and I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. But certainly, you know, we know COVID-19 and long COVID often is associated with severe outcomes from COVID-19. And so, you know, these drugs have the ability to at least uh, lower the severity of disease. So, you know, they may be able to prevent long COVID complications for, again, people who are able to access them in the manner uh, that they're prescribed for. I've had two AZs, AstraZeneca shots. I've had one booster shot, which was Pfizer. Mm -hmm. I've also had COVID-19. So I have those natural immunities built up as well. Do, am I in, in reasonably comfortable positioning for not getting Omicron? You, provided you are a healthy person, um, then you are in reasonable shape for not getting moderate to severe COVID-19 caused by the variants that we have looked at so far. With Omicron, we simply don't know yet how good our immunity is going to um, handle that virus. We know that um, when you're immunized, you generate cells that actually get better and better over time. So these are called B cells and they become memory B cells. And if they're reactivated, they become antibody producing cells. And those memory B cells um, over a quite a long period, we know at least 12 weeks, can keep going through an immune response and keep learning more and more about what you were vaccinated against. And that is the spike protein. And during that process, we do know, and this is published data, peer reviewed data, that the breadth of the immune response actually increases over time. So your immune system is better able to deal with variants. Now, whether it's gonna be able to deal with a variant like Omicron is obviously the $60 million question that labs all over the world, including labs in Canada as part of Covernet, are looking at very intensively. But from what we know about um, the immune response, there should be some immune immunity even to variants like Omicron. But the, the data have yet to emerge to really uh, validate that statement. Well, this is the big concern, right? Because uh, I, I guess we're up to about 80% of Ontarians right now who've 
or almost 80% who've been double vaxxed, and now some people are going off and getting their booster shots as well. And I'm sure they are asking the question, am I doing all this for naught, given that Omicron may be more powerful than any of the uh, inoculations that I'm taking? What would you yeah. say to them? Yeah, well, that's a super fair question that's on everyone's minds. But when you have been vaccinated, you are not starting at square one. You've generated immune response that is 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 going to have some cross protective immunity. So, for example, so far the variants we've seen, the one that's the most divergent, is beta. So this is the variant that was first detected in South America. Um, beta had a lot of mutations where the antibody response to beta took a hit. It wasn't a complete nullification of that antibody response, but definitely took a hit in terms of its ability to neutralize a virus in a dish. Now, the cellular immunity, in particular the T-cell response, did not take a hit against beta. In fact, some of our T-cells can recognize uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, that have been previously trained to recognize other circulating coronaviruses. So this exquisite specificity of the immune response is a little more relaxed when it comes to the T cell response. And so if we take beta as an example, and it's a good example because it's the most mutated of the bunch, mm -hmm then hopefully T cells will still be able to respond to Omicron. And I think there's a good chance they will. So no, what you are doing is not for naught. <laughs> if I can use a, a double naught. <laughs> so people should, uh, if they haven't been vaccinated, this is the best way that they can prepare for Omicron. And uh, we know that vaccine companies are already adjusting their vaccine strategies to deal with Omicron. That's just some of what we covered this week on the agenda. For more, including the full conversations, you can visit our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's it for this Friday, December 3rd, 2021. Monday on the program, a feature interview with writer and artist Douglas Copeland on his new book and our oversharing social media obsessed modern world. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thank you for watching TVO and for joining us online at TVO.org. Have a great weekend and Steve will see you again on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pagan is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario Hubs are made possible by the Barry and Lori Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman.